you have a very good sixth sense when it comes to directors because I still find it amazing that despite the fact that John Singleton had never <laughs> never directed <laughs> anything and here you are you know early 30s you're already accomplished you've already been in in in, in major movies and you decide you know what? I'm, I'm going to ride with this young kid and, and see what was, see where we go. <laughs> Listen, the script was flawless. The script for Boys in the Hood was flawless, and he wrote it, and he wrote it twice. All right, he entered it into that fellowship, that Scott, whatever it is, that that writing competition at SC where he went to school. He entered that script in that competition twice, so he had done his homework. And then the other thing that is really amazing, I just recently found this, I found this out after John had passed, uh, is that he grew up across the street from a drive-in movie theater. Mm -hmm. He spent some time across the street from a drive-in movie theater. I, heard. Um, I hope this is true. Um, but that tells me one of the things about John was so amazing and explained it was, you know, John always talked in pictures. He'd be like, let me tell you about this thing I'm working on. And he'd start just telling you about the pictures. Um, John's first language was the moving image, like images. He talked in images. He thought in pictures. Um, so it just it just felt right to me. So I imagine. I mean, I, I know the budget for Boys in the Hood was not very big. No, <laughs> no right. And was this when you read the? I mean, I I I know he wanted you to play Furious Styles. Mm -hmm. Um, when you read the character um, of Furious, mm -hmm. what for you was it that really struck you as, in terms of figuring out who this man is? Um, that wasn't really my first concern. Hmm. The thing that was great about it was when I finished reading it, I was in tears. When I turned the last page, I was crying when I read Boys and So that tells you everything about the story. Because it wasn't about the character for me. It was about the story. It was about those three young men. Uh, my only concern, the only sort of thing that stuck out for me about Furious was there's that whole scene where he goes, he takes Ricky and Trey to the vacant lot and he explains gentrification and all of that. And that was my, my only concern was about making sure that the tone of that was correct because I didn't want to hit people over the head. It felt... Uh, in your mind, you wondered if it was too messaging, right? I'm right. It, it, it's yeah. there's clearly there's a, there's messaging in it, and that's great. I just wanted to make sure that the message was received, and so it wasn't born out of anger, but it was born out of facts, clear-eyed facts. It's just I'm going to give you the facts here. I'm just going to tell you how this works. I'm not going to tell you how to feel about it, though. <laughs> right, but here's let me lay out the case. Uh, let me lay out what this is. Yeah, it feels like every every actor uh, inevitably you hit a downturn in your career. What would you say was the most humbling point in your career? Um, I would say after having done Apocalypse Now when I was, you know, fifteen, sixteen, uh, having the movie come out when I was 18 and the anticipation was, you know, this is the most expensive movie ever made. You know, it's got one of the greatest living actors who's, you know, Marlon Brando's in the movie. Uh, the guy that directed The Godfather directed the movie and blah, blah, blah. It's gonna just be great. And it was a commercial flop. It was a critical success. It has gone on to become a masterpiece of American cinema but it was a commercial flop when it came out. And I couldn't get a job for 15 months after it came out. And that was very humbling for me. So what did you do during that time when you couldn't get a job? Uh, I spent a lot of time hanging out with interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't beg a follow-up. <laughs> People. Nope. I hung around <laughs> with a lot of interesting and, and shall we say, unsavory characters. <laughs> okay. you, you know, you can look at it as research if you want. Like, absolutely. Like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It was all grist for the mill. It was all very much, you know, part of like, 
listen, it was the time of ashes. Young men, young women, you know, as we leave childhood and we go into young adulthood, there is that whole apprenticeship stage. You know, when you find something that you want to do, you have to find in the old world I'm talking about now. I'm talking about in the very old world, not just last century, but centuries before last century, where you you find a, a teacher, a master, a mentor, and you go and you go to work for them and you work for nothing, and you work for free, and you do the shit work and you get dirty. And um, so that's essentially what that period of time in my life was. It was the time of ashes for me, where, you know, I didn't know whether I was going to become the person that I've become, where I had doubt and where I had adversity. And I had to deal with, you know, the realities of um, the racism that exists in our country, not just our business, but in our country. Um, as a young Black man who was artistic, who was different, you know, um, and I, you know, I survived it, but I was here in LA for, you know, three, four years trying to like be, you know, be an actor. And I was already an actor. I was already an established actor, but nobody in the established business either gave or knew what to do with me because they found me to be too different, too eccentric, too intimidating, too whatever. You know, in the back of the day, we would have said too black, too strong. You know what I'm saying? But it was a combination of things. And some of it was on me because I have to admit, I had a big chip on my shoulder. I was like, don't y'all understand? Don't y'all understand who I'm is? What's wrong with y'all? Like, I just made the most expensive movie in the world. Don't you know what this is? They're like, yeah, maybe you're a little more than we need right now. <laughs> so. Well, during that period, did you ever think maybe this isn't the profession for me? Well, it's the only time where I had doubts about it. It was the only time I had doubts that I was going to actually succeed. Not that it was not for me, but just that it just wasn't going to happen for me. Mm. When, um, you know, once you finally did sort of get back in the swing of things, what did, what, whatever you learned during that gap of time when you didn't work, how did you find a way to, I guess, incorporate this into what you, you know, as your career then began yes, to pick up? Yes, yeah. it was really about the life stuff and it was really about humility. It was really the mm -hmm. thing that I was lacking was humility. Mm -hmm. I lacked mm -hmm. humility. I had a lot of talent. I had a lot of intelligence. I had an attitude, you know. I was angry. I was resentful of a lot of things, but none of those things really mattered. After a while, I was wreck. I came to realize, like, all that stuff that you're angry about, that you're resentful about, that's not helping. You, you know, you walk into a room full of anger and resentment. People can feel it, and they just don't want to be bothered. It's not personal. <laughs> they just don't want to be bothered by that they don't want to have to negotiate with that and deal with that why are you bringing that to work you know work should be fun you should be able to enjoy it